at CTBUH 2013, and we're going to talk about some uh, London issues uh, from both an architecture and an engineering standpoint. And we've got Paul Finch, who is the program director with the World Architecture Festival, and Paul's background is architecture journalism. Uh, among his credits, he was editor of the Architectural Review from 2005 to 2009 and is also a deputy chairman of the UK Design Council. We also have uh, Bob Lang, who is with Arup, that is a professional services group headquartered here in London, uh, which provides engineering, design, and uh, other consulting services for all aspects of the built environment. We wanted to take up with the topic of uh, the permanency of buildings because uh, we're, we're in a new age of building here in London, but the question is how long will these buildings last and should they be built to last? There's an interesting session at this London conference on future-proofing tall buildings. This is a, a hot topic in London because what we're asking ourselves is how come there are buildings from <clears throat> the 50s, 60s and 70s, towers that seem perfectly capable of having a second life um, after their initial period as an office or whatever it might be and seem to be capable of being adapted, upgraded uh, in an economically sensible manner so that they will have another life of 30, 40 or 50 years. On the other hand, there are buildings that, for whatever reason, are so hopeless that they're like, they're like you know, sick horses. You, they need to be put out of their misery. And the question I think this raises for designers and for clients is what are you looking to do in terms of the longevity of your building and how can you future-proof that building? How can you ensure that a building could have a second life um, with the same use or a second life with another use and what design factors and what structural factors and what loading factors make it more or less difficult uh, to design for longevity. In the past so many buildings have been demolished purely because the floor to floor heights don't work as we've seen many many times. As technology advances the need to compress these floor to floor heights diminishes the services that you put into the buildings take up less space. So to, to demolish buildings purely on the basis of floor to floor height is, 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 is beginning to change. So what are the constants there? The constants are that we're looking for better energy performance and for that you read facade. There are some huge advances in uh, facade technology that mean you can take an existing building and bring it up to modern standards, certainly in terms of energy. Now, the next major factor in any tall building, aside from structure, are the elevators. And the expectancy of major corporates to move people up and down tall buildings such that they don't spend half the time, half the day getting up and half the day getting down, have increased immensely. We now create tall buildings with stacked shaft, double cars, people can move around the building far more easily. So mm. I would suggest that the, the, the major influence is how you bring elevators to, to modern standards. I think the technology associated with, 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 with the office functions are changing so fast, Wi-Fi being one example, that the need for, for very high spaces may well change. The other interesting thing is buildings that, on the face of it, um, are difficult to justify as a modern office space, yep. but on the other hand may be perfectly capable of being adapted into apartments. Um, the UK government yep. has recently brought in a policy which gives a blanket right, subject to certain exemptions, to people to convert office buildings to residential use without planning permission. In other words, it would simply be a matter of complying with uh, building regulations and building codes rather than formally seeking a planning permission for a change of use. So this has raised the whole question of, uh, of retrofit. Can you, can you make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, as it were? Mm -hmm. And I think that the answer to this, and there's a lot of work being done by architects and engineers in harness on this, mm -hmm. is looking at buildings and working out methodologies for where you think you can at one level, at an extreme level, strip everything out except the structure. But then what are the intermediate phases where at another level you might just be able to get away with changing the facade 
um, and perhaps not even replacing it, perhaps even adapting it or putting in secondary glazing or whatever it may be. And this is opening up some big possibilities for uh, keeping the visual appearance of our cities um, rather than going in for wholesale demolition and being much more thoughtful about when we demolish a building in its entirety or when we try to retain those essential elements which will be perfectly good for a hundred years. Have, or and I, I, re years. I really think there's some issues of, of, of policy, be it local or governmental here, because some, some areas are actually resisting this conversion because they, they want to retain uh, trade, they want to retain industry, they want industry in the broadest sense, they, they, they want to maintain commerce. And there are cert certain areas in the UK that are, are actively resisting this, this conversion that is now... Yes, and to be fair, I mean, the government has allowed exemptions to mm. local authorities, municipal authorities, city governments that have made a case for why they should be excluded from this policy. But it has, for the first time, um, I think in, in policy terms, raised this issue that actually it's inherently desirable to make the most of your building stock mm -hmm. rather than building and exactly. demolishing and building and demolishing. Yeah. Now, in some parts of the world, I think this wouldn't be understood at all. I think in Hong Kong, they think you were crazy. I mean, if you can make more money out of a building by demolishing the existing one, go right ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. do it. But I think in Western Europe, certainly, um, green policies are starting to say, well, we need to look at the embodied energy of the building, mm -hmm. all the energy that went into the cement the steel, um, the glazing, uh, every part, and, and where we can retain that embodied energy, um, it's desirable to do so. And actually, the energy cost of demolition and replacement um, is pretty horrendous because not only are you losing all that embodied, embodied energy involved in the demolition, but of course you've then got to generate the same amount of building material, possibly more, um, in a new way. Um, that, which incidentally is why timber has suddenly become an interesting <laughs> topic of discussion. Well, because and that's a good thought. Yeah. I, I, you know, for the life of me, can't understand or have, have yet to understand why wood would even be considered in a high rise. What are the reasons for that? Well, I'll give an example from a building that won an award in East London, which was a residential mm -hmm. town. It's quite modest. I mean, we're not talking about high rise buildings here. I think the engineers who looked at this said they thought this. It's a timber structural system, so it's not timber on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, could be used up to about maybe 22, 23 stories. They'd had discussions with the, the regulations people about this, and that seemed to work. Well, the first, the first reason for these, these quite modest towers is that um, it's quite fast assembly because they're kits. Mm -hmm. And basically you have people who come in, it's like, it's like three guys with rather sophisticated screwdrivers who stack, these, <laughs> stack, stack it up, <coughs> leave, leave a, a core for, for, the, for the elevator. Mm -hmm. um, it's very quiet, so neighbors mm -hmm. don't have a huge mm -hmm. construction noise mm -hmm. uh, problem. But the really interesting thing about it is that if, for example, as in London, there's a requirement to generate a certain amount of energy in your building um, for green reasons, what these people were able to say was, well, because we've used timber as the structure for this tower, we can do the calculation about the embodied energy in the timber and use that to offset the requirement to exactly. stick solar panels all over the roof, which mm -hmm. is all a bit, mm -hmm. bit of a phony, really. Mm -hmm. And of course, from, a, from a, an embodied energy point of view, I mean, wood only releases carbon uh, when it burns or when it rots. Mm -hmm. So when it's used as a construction material, it's, it's encapsulated it, mm -hmm. and actually it will last for hundreds of and years. It, and it has fantastic insulating properties. The, the, the issue, in, certainly in, 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 in European climates, North America and so on, is there are vast temperature ranges. The idea of making anything quite thin or slim is often defeated by, by coal bridging, basically exchange of coal, of, of, of uh, temperature through, through the section. Timber is fantastic at that. But I think what we should do is not just consider height, but con consider the whole aspect ratio of the building. That is to say, it's shape on plan combined with height. Because if you get those two things working together, the forces in the system come down, and let's be clear, timber 
uh, is, isn't the strongest of materials, but it has great strengths in certain directions. And the design, the conception, the totality of the of, of the building needs to be needs to be geared to the material. If you get that right in a holistic sense, then there's absolutely no reason why you can't go moderately high. Have we covered Have we covered all of the uh, all of the factors that figure into why a building becomes obsolete? I think the if you talk particularly of tall buildings, um, increasingly they are driven by their location to transport hubs and infrastructure. Uh, the more we look at these around the world, the more apparent it is that the, uh, well, two things. Firstly, that the, 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 the total energy consumed by this product we, we call the tall building is, is really a function of two things. On one, and the second one vastly uh, outweighs the first. That is to say, the, the energy it takes to construct it. But if you take the, 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 if you take the entirety of the life of the project, by far the biggest carbon footprint is due to people travelling there. I think, but I think there's another there's another reason why tall buildings um, may need may require demolition and certainly require upgrades, and they just get tired. And uh, I mean, every 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 building style in history uh, needs repair and maintenance and, and occasional replacement. And tall buildings are no different. The thing about tall buildings is it's a more expensive exercise. I mean, you take an ordinary row house built in brick. Every 20 years it may need repointing. So what? You know, one guy can do it in you know, a couple of the five days or something. You take the equivalent of an office tower. I mean, this is a very heavy investment. Well, thank you both for a, for a great conversation. Paul Finch with uh, the World Architecture Festival and Bob Lang, who's a structural engineer with Arab. Thanks for visiting us in London. Thank you. Thank you very much.